If you've been in the online education space for any amount of time, you have probably heard people talk about the importance of frameworks. But have you ever sat down with somebody who really understands the psychology behind developing a fantastic framework and has used them to grow multi-million dollar businesses? Well, I'm sitting down with that person today. You're gonna hear from Mel Abraham as he breaks down exactly how to develop a winning framework for your business. Friend, I have a special treat for you today. We are talking with Mel Abraham. Now, if you know anything about Mel, we could be talking to him about a thousand things because he's been in business for a very long time, maybe multiple decades, and has had so much success in his business endeavors. He talks a lot about wealth management and how to become an affluent entrepreneur. But one of the things that I think is a unique genius that Mel has is how he leverages frameworks inside of his business. So we're gonna be talking today about how he does that, how to create a good framework, and all of the different ways that you can leverage frameworks not only to get more conversions, to build your brand, but also to help your members make more progress. Now, if you're not familiar with Mel, Mel is the founder of Thoughtpreneur Academy and Business Breakthrough Academy. This is where he helps entrepreneurs bring their businesses to the world and build the lifestyle that they want. He is one of the most sought after financial experts. He's an entrepreneurial mentor and a strategic thinker that many people look to. In fact, most of the people I would say that you probably look up to in our online space are looking to Mel as their thought leader. He has also bought and sold numerous multi-million dollar businesses for himself as well as his clients, and he's the number one national best-selling author of The Entrepreneur's Solution, The Modern Millionaire's Path to More Profit, Fans, and Freedom. But today, we're going to be leveraging Mel's brain when it comes to the idea of frameworks. Mel, I am so excited that you are here. You know, we were talking just before I turned this on, and I was telling you I was listening to your podcast this morning, which I'll tell you was perfect timing because I have my my journal actually right here where I was mapping out my world domination and life domination plans last night. I wake up, I'm getting ready. I look at your podcast and it's like this affluent entrepreneur. I'm like, okay, what is this? I listen to it. You break down this amazing four-part framework. I can even like spit it out right now because I remembered it so well. I get in the car to go drop my kids off at school with my husband and I share the framework with them. I'm like, we need to apply this. We need to learn this. And I'm like, this is the power of frameworks. And I know there's so much we could be talking to you about today because you've just had so much success and you've been in this game, if you don't mind me saying, for quite a while. What I've noticed about what you've done and what everybody has pointed out to me is that you are the master of frameworks and leveraging frameworks in your business to not just be able to sell more, but to really be able to differentiate yourself. So Thank you for coming and talking to us about frameworks today. Oh my God, I am so happy to be here. I think it's going to be a ton of fun. We obviously, we just met and it was, it, it's kind of interesting because you talk about community and everything and, and literally there was a post and that you asked a question and then people put my name in and I put my name in and then we got on DMs and we started to chat through DM and here we are. And I think that's the beauty of reaching out, connecting and trying to communicate more directly with, with our market, with our audience, and with the people that are in our world. Well, you are speaking my language and the language of my listeners, for sure, because we're all about creating really thriving communities and how that supports your business in so many ways. We talk a lot about the retention side, obviously, but I tell people all the time that 80% of my success is due to the relationships that I've built in my business. 100%. Like, the knowledge is a little bit of it. Will and grit is a big part of it, but relationships are a huge part. And so when I had a client, actually a client and a friend of mine, ask and just say, hey, you have your framework. I need a framework in my business or we need to refine a framework. Who do you go to? And I'm like, oh, I'll put it out to my network and I'll see. And overwhelmingly, it was like, Mel Abraham, Mel Abraham, Mel Abraham. I'm like, okay, let's talk about this. And then the more I thought about it, I'm like, yeah, we need to have a conversation because I know my framework 
has been the foundation of my business and I believe is what has set me apart from everybody else out there that's talking about community. So before we dive in, I always like to just get to know you a little bit by talking about your favorite community that you've ever been a part of and what you love about it. So it was actually an entrepreneur community. It was actually a mastermind that I was involved in a number of years ago. But the reason I liked it, it wasn't all business. Uh, every time we got together, every time we would come together for business, there was always a day that was dedicated to service. And that service was working at an orphanage, building homes, making a difference because look, we're blessed, we're privileged, however you want to put it. We, I don't think we're lucky because we've worked hard, but I think that we've had the blessings of our life and to try and pay that forward is important. Too often we can see that people, they may be successful, but are they really, I believe that legacy is something that we create in the moment. It's not something that we have to die and leave behind, but that when we interact with someone in a moment, we can shift the life, we can give them a smile, we can make them better. And I think that when we use our talents, our skills, our tools, and our gifts to make a great life for ourselves, but at the same time, give a path to a better life for others, then that's where I think that we should be playing. And that was one, probably one of my favorite things to do. In fact, one of the, in my first book, the only picture that I have in there is of me and a little boy. Which we didn't speak the language, but we spoke the language of connection at an orphanage because I walked into the orphanage and he saw me, I saw him and he just came running up and he would not leave my arms the whole time I was there. Oh man, I can picture moments like that in my life. And I love that because whether they know it or not, when they did it, serving together is actually one of the best ways to create a connection among two people because you're working together towards a common cause, which is the first part of my framework. You're working together towards a common cause and having that and then serving alongside each other creates this shared experience that creates a bond that you can't get back. I think to very similar instances for myself, like doing like a mission trip, for example, in college and, and the friendships that I developed there. And nobody can take that from us, right? That moment, that shared experience will be with us forever. And those are the people that when you see them, you have a deeper connection with them than you do a lot of people, even if you haven't seen them for years because you shared those moments together. All right. So, okay. When we're talking about frameworks here, I got great advice when I was going out into the world of trying to teach what I had done for so long, where they said, you really got to have a framework around this. And I remember when I was first asked to speak on stage years ago about how I create a thriving community, that was the first thing that came to mind was like, I need to flesh out this framework a little bit more so that can be the thing that I teach about. And it has grown legs from there. It's become the foundation of my course and really everything that I teach. But I'm curious, like, how did you discover the power and the beauty of frameworks? Because I know you teach a bunch of different things and you have different businesses and revenue streams because that's a big part of what you teach. But like, where did the framework piece become so important for you? So it's an odd story. So I'm a CPA by education, but I didn't do typical CPA stuff. I primarily valued businesses bought and sold businesses, consulted to build businesses, but I got involved with being an expert witness in financial matters. So I would testify in front of a judge, in front of a jury. I'd be the kind of person they would hire to testify against Bernie Madoff and people like that. So one of the things that happened is the first couple of cases, I would go in and here I am going on the flip chart and doing math for a jury. And it's like about as interesting as watching paint dry. And so my opposition, the opposing expert would do the same thing. And I had an idea one time because I was studying the influence, persuasion, and communication. And I said to my attorney, I said, will you trust me on this? And they said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to try and draw a picture for them. And so that case, what I did is when I got called up to testify. I got the permission from the judge. He said, is it okay if I drew a picture for you and told you a story? And so I took the numbers that I was using and I drew it into a framework 
into a picture and told them a story around the numbers without necessarily doing all the intricate math and everything. And then I just sat down. Now, when the jury went to the deliberation room, the only thing they remembered was the story and the picture. They never understood the math. But what happened is that we won that case, hands down. And from that point forward, I started to really dig into how do you become more influential with your communication? And the key with frameworks for me was that I realized that since now, when I talk about frameworks, I'm talking about diagrammatic frameworks, not a mnemonic, not an acronym. An acronym is just meant for memorization. But when you create a framework, a diagram, the proper way, you create simplicity out of complexity, you connect emotion and logic, you drive them to action through understanding, and you have layers of influence in it because of the way you unpack the framework. And so what I started to do is look at how can we do this? Because a visual intake is actually an emotional intake. It's why we have the emotional response to seeing a baby or a puppy. But because there's structure, deliberate intentional structure to the framework, squares, circles, triangles put together in a very specific way, it creates logic. So it's the one tool I found that I can marry the emotional side of our world to the logical side of our world and have it become vivid. And so that's how it started to come about. And if you follow me for any length of time, you will know that everything I do is driven by a framework everything. And I start to see things in frameworks. I remember sitting in an audience of a dear friend of mine who was, he had his live event. He's got 500 people there. He's teaching, he's doing his thing. And I'm on my iPad. And by the time he's done, I walk up and I say, that's your last two hours right there in a picture. And he goes, you're like the cartoonist at Disney. <laughs> so that's how it came about. That's how I started to do it and explore the ideas of using visual frameworks as a mechanism and method to one, get my point across, make it memorable, make it valuable, make it distinct and have me stand out. This is so important. I'm glad you shared the history of that because um, first off, those that know me know I'm nerding out with you right now because you're talking about human psychology in the brain. And I'm always reserving myself a little bit on this podcast <laughs> because I'm like, oh, they don't need to know all of that. But at the same time, it's really important because it's human to human and our brain does work in a certain way and having those different inputs like that visual input, the emotional input, even with the story, all of that comes into play and it's very important. But one of the things that you said that I just want to point out to those listening is that this didn't start as a tool that he was using to sell his info product, right? This started as a way for him to be able to transmit understanding of a complicated concept to people in a way that they would remember. So if you are a course creator or a consultant even, or you have a membership or a group program, that is your job. I talk about this all the time. You cannot say, I'm not responsible for my people's success. Yeah, to a point, like you can't, you can lead the horse to water, you can't make them drink. I get it. But so often we are spending so much time on the marketing and the selling that we're not investing the work in creating a solid product that gives people the best opportunity of success. And so what I'm hearing is that creating frameworks around what you want to teach is doing that work. It's making it to where you take this complicated concept, you deliver it in a way that people are going to be able to understand and implement, which ultimately leads to more success and more progress for your people, which is ultimately what we want for them. And without a doubt. And I think that with what you said, how you, people say, well, I'm not responsible for their success. No, you're not. But you are responsible to them to give them the tools and the training that would get them success if they acted on it. And so this idea for me was this, the reality that communication isn't a two-way street. It's a one-way street in the sense that I have to take 100% responsibility for my message to land correctly on the people I'm trying to talk to or give that message to. And I can't turn around and say, well, they don't understand it because they're whatever. They're not as smart 
or they're not as sophisticated. No, I didn't communicate it in an effective way for them to understand it. It's my responsibility to do that. And when we do that, I think that we empower ourselves to look at it through the eyes of saying, okay, how do I make sure that this is going to land for them? Now, frameworks is one of the biggest tools, but also metaphors, analogies are huge in trying to bring those things home too, because we're relating it to something they already know. And when we start to understand those things, when we're delivering through a framework, you start to up-level your ability to communicate. And it's not, this is something that I get from people who say, oh, you're just manipulating the mind. I said, no, I'm concentrating their focus. And when I can get them to focus, the idea with a jury was I needed them to buy. And this is something to think about is that if they don't buy the initial premise of what you're going to say, they will not buy the promise of what you're going to sell. And so I need to know that they're with me every step of the way and that I want to focus that jury or I want to focus that boardroom or the banker or whoever it is I'm talking to on the specific point they need right now. Then I'll move them to the next point, then the next point. So it's like connect the dots. So by the time we get to the end, the only logical conclusion is to rule in your favor, to buy the course, to hire you to do these things. If we don't control their focus, we can't make sure that the message lands. Yeah, and that's always the challenge for so many of us, right, is we have to get their attention, but we have to sustain their attention, get them to focus, and then ultimately get them into momentum and taking action. And it's so good because recently interviewed my friend, Dr. Carrie Rose, and she was talking deep about the psychology of course creation. And it was a lot of these concepts and recognizing not only do we want to communicate effectively, but everybody learns differently. We have people who are neurodivergent. In fact, those of you that serve entrepreneurs and business owners, many of them are dyslexic and neurodivergent and their brain works differently. And so when we communicate things in the way that we understand them, we're missing out on probably 70% of the people that we're educating. So I love how frameworks and like you said, metaphors and analogies and all of this come into play. And I think about my framework even and I'm going, oh, man, I want to I want to uh, go deeper by creating some metaphors and analogies around that that core framework, which you all hear me if you listen to my podcast at all. I have frameworks for a lot of things now, but it started with one. It started with this one framework. And I tell people all the time, this isn't something the framework itself isn't something I invented. It's a truth that I am communicating. I know the four keys to a thriving community from the dawn of time, from the civil rights movement and beyond, right? This isn't something I just whipped up one day. I am curating knowledge from the experience that I've had and from the research that I've done and have put it into a translatable format. And now I try to do that all the time with my retention framework and my progress wheel framework. And it ends up becoming such an effective way to communicate a concept. And so can you help me selfishly understand like what makes a good framework? If somebody is listening to this right now and they're like, yeah, I don't have a framework. I don't have a visual around that, what I teach. Where, how would you get them started? So there's two things to think. And I'll walk through the four pieces of a powerful framework in a second here. But I think that you hit on it that there's a lot of different learning styles out there. When I capture, so I, when I'm speaking and I'm creating content, I actually catalog my content in a very specific way. I know what the point is I'm trying to make, but then I catalog it in the sense of, I define upfront what my analogies are or metaphors. I capture them on a document. I decide upfront, because that speaks to the visionary, the emotional visionary abstract thinker. I capture the stories that will bring the point home. That speaks to the more detailed emotional person. So it's really the right brain that we're speaking to. I capture the stats or the steps that they need. That's the data wonk, the people that are detail oriented and want the logic. And then I capture the framework. And so what happens is I'm exercising the muscle of capturing and cataloging the content that gives me the flexibility Say I'm going to speak to a group of engineers. I know that I'm going to lean to the left side of their brain. I'm going to lean to the logic side, but I don't have to go research. It's already done. 
And I've done the work to allow me to speak to creatives, to speak to logic folks, to speak big thinking, detailed thinking, all of that. And I think that we tend to not do the work to allow us to set things up. But there have been times that I'm betting that you've watched someone on stage. They do a presentation. It could be 30 minutes, it could be 45 minutes, it could be an hour. And you look at them and you go, oh, that just dented the surface. There is much more to them. And the reason there's much more to them is because they did the deeper work to know when we take your framework, you've got years and years of knowledge that go along with that framework that you might present in a half an hour, but the people are, in, are sitting there realizing, oh my God, there is so many more layers to her and to what she knows. And so that's the first thing to realize is that it's not just something that we slap together. And I'm going to throw this out at the beginning. Cute doesn't sell. I want effective. Okay. So I know that we want to keep it in brand colors, but you know what? Red, yellow, and green have an impact psychologically on us. And if we understand the psychology behind it, we will depart when it's necessary from our brand colors and trying to make things cute. So there's four things that you want in our framework. The first is the formation. That is a combination of circles, triangles, and squares. Okay, those are the only three shapes that are out there in the world. If you want an oval, squash the circle. If you want a rectangle, squash the square. But those are the only three things. But if you think about it, the question is, what is the impact on the mind, the psyche of a specific shape? If I think about a square, it typically is boundaries, it's structure. If I think about a circle, it's a lot of inclusiveness and so there is this underlying psychology behind the shape. A triangle can sense growth or direction or movement. So we need to understand what shapes are going to tie to the point we want to make, the formation. The second piece is that we want to look at the information that we want to put in place, okay? And the information is the stuff they need to know. And here's the challenge that a lot of us will do is that we know a lot of stuff. The first time I did my, a live event was in uh, 2012 and I had 30 people in the room and I gave them three days of entrepreneurship and all kinds of stuff. It was a ton of good information and it was totally useless because I dumped everything on them. We need to think about, I tell people to use the three hour rule. We're gonna go to a gourmet coffee shop like Starbucks and we're going to sit there for three hours. I'm going to have the time for you with you for three hours. What are the points, the three to five things I need to know if I'm never going to see you again? That's it. Stop there. Because the reason we stop there is our job is to get them a micro success so they have the belief in themselves to take the next step, not to get them all the way there because it's too overwhelming. So we need to set them up for success. So what's the information? that needs to get them from point A to point B, not all the way to Z. This is where a lot of people stop. The other two elements of this is where it starts to come to life. The third element is emotion. What emotion do I want to instill in the framework, in the delivery of the framework? Is it angst? Is it desire? Is it frustration? There are all those emotions that we can put into it. Is it possibility? Is it aspiration? How we build the framework has to have an emotional compelling element to it. And so we decide up front, because that's what attaches us to the heart, what's the emotion I'm trying to create with this image or this diagram that I'm going to create? And then the fourth framework is the thing that brings it to life, and that's orchestration. So we have formation, we've got information, we've got emotion, and we have orchestration. You never ever turn around and take your framework and slap it up on a slide or slap it up on the board. Because remember, as I said, our job is to control their focus. And so what happens if I take a framework that has say eight or 10 items on it, when I'm speaking of item one, they might be looking at item four going, I wonder what he means by that. And now I've lost their focus. So the magic is in the orchestration and the reveal. And you think about the reveal of the letters and with Vanna White and all that stuff. And so what we typically do is we build the frameworks for them step by step. 
and make sure that they're with us every step of the way and make sure that they're in the right emotional state every step of the way. So when it is complete, they go, ooh, I get it. I got it. I need it. That's the key. Now, if you go back and you watch or listen to this, I just did exactly what I told you verbally. So good. I'm sitting here going, okay, intuitively, my community framework is circles. My retention accelerator framework is a triangle. And it's all lining up. I didn't sit and plan it from a psychology perspective. But even just going back in my brain, I'm going, okay, how do I apply this to my frameworks that are already existent? And going, oh, yeah, I get it. And I did have a feeling about circles. And I had a feeling about triangles. And that's what led me to choose those shapes for those different frameworks that really call people to a different sort of feeling. And I love that you really tie in the emotion and the orchestration piece. Because I have seen frameworks presented in a way that defeat the purpose of the framework because it's overwhelming. They just like, they just put it all on there. And I'm also pretty sure that the information part was just like, here's everything I've ever learned in my entire life. And let me put it into a framework because someone said I need a framework. But what I hear you saying is that's not the point of this. The point of this isn't to distill your life's work into one graphic that has like 50,000 layers and takes two hours to teach. It's about taking one core concept and a few key pieces of information and displaying them in a visual way that's not just, oh, here's a visual that fits the shape and size of what I'm trying to do and has enough spots, but actually keeps in mind the emotions we tie to those different shapes. But then creating it is just the start, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, man. Okay. So can you give us, I know you just walked through this, but for example, like your affluent entrepreneur framework, maybe that's one to share, but I want to give people more examples of this. They've heard me talk about my community framework, cause, culture, communication, and connection, and how those four things work together to create a thriving community. But I want to give them another example as well, if you don't mind sharing one, so that they can start to just see how this comes together. Because I will say this, when I first asked about frameworks on that Facebook post that you got tagged in, people were saying, oh, I have a template for this. And they were sharing like Google Doc templates. They're like, oh, I'm really good at creating these. I'm like, okay, clearly we're not on the same page about what a framework means. And so I really want to drive home for people how this, what it is, how it applies, give them another example. And then let's talk about like, how to leverage them, how to leverage them to get more sales, how to leverage them to keep people in your programs and help them get more results. So let me walk through, I'll walk through the beginnings of my Affluence Blueprint Framework. And I'll do a portion of this that I typically do in my keynotes. So I don't unpack the whole thing because there's another part of this. When there's open space, the mind wants to fill it. That means I keep a connection and they know there's a gap and they go, oh, I need the answer. I need the answer. I need the answer. So here's how this goes. This is about me trying to help people become what I call an absolute entrepreneur. And so I'm going to do it as if I was presenting it. So you'll start to see it and then I'll unpack it if that works. That'd be wonderful. And I'm selfishly taking this in. I have three speaking engagements over the next three weeks where I present my framework and I'm already going, oh, we're going to go back and work on that. So I'm looking forward to it myself. Sweet. So here's the thing that I've been obsessed with for most people is I want you to become an affluent entrepreneur. And what that means to me is that I, what I found in the years that I've worked with entrepreneurs and their money to try and make that happen is there's three critical outcomes that we need. And the first critical outcome is that they end up with a richer lifestyle. And now this isn't about the money in the bank. Richer lifestyle is about the feelings you have and how you're experiencing life. And we know a lot of people that that probably have made a lot of money, but they're miserable. Their health sucks. Their relationships suck. And that isn't richness. Richness is the experience and the joy that you have. Now, it could be a tent in Montana, a yacht in Monaco. No judgment here, but I'll take the yacht in Monaco. But the question is, what's your richer lifestyle? The second uh, critical outcome is that you have a deeper impact. You know, as entrepreneurs, we know that we're impacting our customers, our clients, the people we serve. There's two other impacts that we fail to really deliberately think about. 
And the second impact is to the right and left. It's the people we love. It's the people that share life with us. And we got to ask ourselves deliberately, how are we showing up in that space to make that impact as well as the impact in front of us? And then the third impact that we typically leave off the table is the one in the mirror. Who do we become in the process of becoming an affluent entrepreneur? And when we know that we can impact and become the kind of person we want to be and that we're impacting the people we love and the people we serve, that's the kind of impact we're looking for. And then the third critical outcome for an affluent entrepreneur is that they have complete freedom. Now, I have a lot of people that say, I just want financial freedom. Well, that's the most rudimentary freedom because it really isn't the money we want. It's the things the money can give us. And so there's two other freedoms that I think we actually are looking for. And the second freedom is time freedom. The freedom to decide what we're going to do with our time. I actually think our wealth should be measured in time and not money. If I asked you today, how much of the moments of your life do you control? That would tell me how rich your life is. And the third freedom is mind freedom. It's about having the freedom and the peace of mind to know that the people, the causes, the missions, the movements that you care about are taken care of long after you're gone. And so that's the three critical outcomes of an affluent entrepreneur. And now you sit back and go, great, Mel. What do I need? You need three systems in place. The first system is you need a system to generate. This is to generate income. This is where you scale and optimize your profits. This is how you go from, from a drip of cash flow to a flood of cash flow. This is how you make the money. And most entrepreneurs are really good at that. They make the money. But what they don't do is that they end up spending the money so they don't do the second thing. The second system you need is a system to accumulate the money. How do we take the income and convert it to assets? Because that's where we multiply the money. It's where we become, create a money machine that gives us the support we need to do the things we want to have the time we want because it's not tied to just making money. We create a way to multiply the money we make. And then the third system you need, which unfortunately we need in our society, is we need a system to insulate. How do we go from exposed to protected? How do we shield what we make and our ability to make it so our causes, our missions, our movements, our family, our loved ones, and our future are taken care of? So that was the basics of it. It's so good because if you're listening to this, you can see him doing this from a stage and you can see you doing this on a webinar or as an intro in the onboarding videos inside of a course or a program. And I know I'm sitting here going, this is the missing key for so many entrepreneurs. Like it is the missing key of having this one or two these core frameworks that you know, if somebody calls on you at any moment, at any time, at any day, that you can communicate effectively what it is that you do and what it is that you make possible. And I hope everyone heard that is that it wasn't just like, here's my framework is the how to of accomplishing XYZ result, right? It was based on the outcomes as well that people are desiring. And then you got to, okay, look, and here's like the three things that you need to get in place. But it wasn't, I think we're so quick to get into the how and the details of it all that we think my framework needs to be a step-by-step -step plan. But for you, it's like really designing this life of an affluent entrepreneur. And what is so cool about what you just communicated is that they know though that is their desire. But they can't even communicate it themselves. And so what you've just done is taken what is in their own head and communicated it back to them better than they could have ever communicated it to themselves. Yeah. So here's how this played out, just so you see, because you nailed it on the head. I started with the why. I started with the emotions. So the center section, the critical outcomes was all about the emotions. It was all about their why. It was attaching to it. It was getting them because... Bernice McCarthy talked about this format system in accelerated learning where we lose the people, the why people first. So we want to start with why, go to what, go to how, and then go to if. So all I did was deliver the why and the what. And I went from emotion and abstract to a little more concrete 
and a little more logic. And then if I were to continue, I would then go to the how, and that would be detail and steps. And so, but I needed, I need buy-in. If I don't get, capture them on the richer lifestyle, I won't have them the rest of the way. Yeah. So they're bought into that vision, that why, and then you take them into more of the what and the how. I would imagine, depending on the amount of time that you have, you might even just go into detail on one of those and then you're leaving some mystery, if you will. It's, I have a PDF document that I use that is essentially a whole bunch of blank frameworks of mine. And I teach from that and I might only get to one or two of them. And then there's a whole bunch of other blank frameworks on their PDF. And that tension between like what they see they don't know and what I haven't shared, it's so fascinating, but it leaves them knowing there's so much more to this. And that's part of it, right? So we're talking about how do we leverage these frameworks, right? And clearly speaking, clearly communicating our message to a larger audience, but the conversion side, the conversion piece of it, is that is a big part of that, leaving a little bit of that gap of that unknown, that tension of, I see the framework, I see the vision, but I don't have the full picture. So part of it is that, is, is them seeing that there's a gap. So when we present something, the other way to present something is to highlight their current reality compared to where they want to go. And so now they see that gap. You, by proximity, say, and this is what the mind says, if they understand where I'm at and they really understand where I'm going and they know those two points, I bet they know how to get there. And so then it's a matter of credibility, trust, and them seeing a process that can get them there. And so even if I gave you the how, it becomes a checklist of what you need to do but there's action steps that you probably couldn't do on your own. You could figure it out, but I can get you there faster, easier, and more directly. And so that's part of it. The other side of it is every step of the way, if I can, I will have them self-assess. It's far more powerful for me to say on a scale of one to five or one to 10, where are you on this? Because and I may not reveal exactly why I'm asking it until later because I want their feet in concrete. Once they self-assess, they have a hard time arguing with themselves. But if I turned around and said to someone, well, you know what? I think you're about a six on this. They're going to push back. So I want to put it in their lap. So every step of the way, like I could have asked. So if we talk about the accumulate pillar, of the affluent entrepreneur. And it looks like this. Do you have a critical mass of assets, say half a million dollars or above? If you're on the road to doing that, you know, then maybe you put yourself at a, a three to maybe a six. If you have it already, and half a million is just an arbitrary number, then maybe you're at a seven or eight. If you haven't even thought about it and you think it's down the road, you're probably a one or two. So just on your own, no judgment, just write that number down. And I'll let them write it. Now I'll come back to it later in a presentation or in the sales conversation and do it in a way where I go, remember those numbers? Let's just look at those numbers real quickly. Because then what happens is that let's say they have five factors and all of them are six and below. I simply have to say my job with what I do is to turn all of those into nines and tens for you. And that's it. I'm done. But I let them self-assess. And the thing I like about this is you're talking about it from a sales perspective, but this applies as well inside of our programs because I know I use this. I have them assess on a scale of one to four in each of the pillars. But we talk all the time about getting their buy-in before you ever pitch. And then that buy-in should carry into their program, carry into your program where in your onboarding, you're re-emphasizing that big vision of what you want them to do, but you need a way for them to measure their progress because all the time, like people say, oh, well, this is what, you know, keeps people at the end of the day, if people are making progress, they aren't going to leave. 
but they have to not just be making progress, they have to be able to see the progress they're making. And so being able to assess that through this framework is so valuable. This is huge. So for those that are watching on video, you can see certificates behind me. So I lived in Japan, I've been in the martial arts for 40 plus years. And those are my hand-painted certificates from my sensei in Japan. But in Japan, you only had one color belt, white. By the time you got proficient at the techniques, your white belt was so dark, so dirty, it turned black. When we brought the martial arts back to the States, to Western civilization, the idea of needing to see where we are created the belt system. And what it does is exactly what you're saying, is that, yes, it tells us where you're at in the journey, but more importantly, it tells you how far you've come. And if we don't remind ourselves how far we've come, we tend to discount all our progress and go, this isn't working. And it's so important because I think we've talked about how a framework applies in so many areas of the business. We've talked about how it just helps you communicate more effectively with people when you're trying to teach and educate. We've talked about how it can help you sell or speak on stage and really cast that vision. We're talking now about how it helps measure progress for people inside of your programs. And so if you're not a believer now in frameworks, I don't think we can help you, Mel. I think I think we're just there beyond help at this point. But I would assume now people are, they get it. I hope they get it. And I hope those of us, if you're like me and you have frameworks, you're reevaluating the ones that you have. Because I know for me, I'm like, oh, I, this is what I kind of did on my own. And I've gotten this far. But now I'm, I actually have a deeper understanding of how to craft them better, set them up better, like you said, orchestrate it better, how to leverage it in all different aspects of the business. And so I want to do the work to improve my frameworks. Though I know you have a program, right, that walks people through framework development or training. Tell me a little bit more about that. So I have a larger program called Thoughtpreneur Academy that I could walk through all the cataloging and all that thought process and everything. But I also have a tool that, for those that want to just dig a little bit deeper in, into frameworks itself, that's called the framework formula that we can get. The, I'll get the link to you. I don't have it off the top of my head, but get the link to you that will allow them to go and grab the, it's like a 20-minute training and a worksheet for free to go a little bit deeper to start investigating where they want to go because this Using a framework also becomes your calling card of your brand. If you think about Stephen Covey, he made a whole living on four boxes. And when you think about urgent versus important, here's the interesting thing, because I hear a lot of people say, someone's going to steal my stuff. Well, if it's good stuff, it's probably going to get stolen. You're okay. And the best way to protect it is to be so prolific with it that you cannot be separated from it. The framework that Stephen Covey used, urgent versus important, was not his. It was developed by Eisenhower. Eisenhower, the Eisenhower matrix, right? Yeah. Yep. But he became so prolific at it, people associate it with him. And so if we're worried about people taking our stuff, just put it all over the internet. Put it out there so much with your face and everything attached to it that when someone sees it, they go, that smells. Ah. And the other thing, Mel, I'll say that's really great about that as well is that when people come into your online programs, when people join your membership or buy your course, ideally they all come with a baseline of learning, a baseline of knowledge. And so when everybody's entering through this same gateway, if you will, of having that understanding of your core framework as it relates to that program, you have set yourself up for so much success with that cohort of people or those members, because they're all coming in having already bought in to a really core concept of what you teach. So if anything, that is something that I really encourage. And Stu McLaren has said, I can't remember who he got it from, but he said, you don't have to create a new talk all the time. You just need to get a new audience. And that's something that has really stuck with me for me to go. It's always the framework. It is always the framework. So when I speak, 
over the next three weeks, it's the framework every single time. Exactly. And here's the other, it's, if you want to take it a step even further, and I don't know if you have this, but say you wanted to certify people in your process. The framework is an absolute must because now I have the, a process that I can up level and train the trainers. And now instead of me having to do all the work, I've got this leveraging of my intellectual property beyond me with a quality control of delivery and a revenue stream. Yeah. People are pushing me all the time to certify community managers. And I have not stepped into that because I don't feel like I really fleshed out the frameworks enough to have that. I have a ton of IP, but to be able to translate that IP and have the quality control around it takes a whole nother level of care, which there's tons of people out there with frameworks or with certifications, if you will, that have just thrown things together. So not all certifications are created equal. I will just say that. But I'm like, yeah, if I ever get to the place where I'm going to create a community manager certification, I'm going to come to you first, Mel, so you can help me make sure that all of my frameworks and my IP are good and solid and ready to be translated. So good. So good. I would love to help. Yeah. Okay. Well, this has been so fun. All right. How else can people stay in touch with you? Because I know, obviously, in the description, we're going to have the link to that training that you can get on frameworks. But that is just scratching the surface of who Mel is and what he teaches. And I will just say, because so many of you listening are business owners, I thought, oh, I'll listen to a podcast episode while I was getting ready this morning. And three podcast episodes later, I'm in the car with my husband going, I think we need to rethink our financial strategy. And we have one rental property, but we need to be, you know, setting aside money for the night. So there's so much wealth in being in Mel's world. So what's the best way for them to just continue to soak up everything you have? So there's a couple of things. One, my website, melabraham.com. I'm on Instagram, melabraham9. I have no idea who the first eight are. And I love hearing from people and I love hearing questions. So I put it together a separate site called askmelnow.com where you can leave a question, record a question, and I can bring it on my show, The Affluent Entrepreneur Show, to make sure that we respond, especially to the money and the financial questions, because I want people to feel safe. And that's needed so much right now. And that's one of the things that really stood out to me. We're kind of sidebarring just a bit as we wrap up. But depending on when you're listening to this, we're headed into this time when we, we say we're not in a recession, but you know the, all the signs are saying we're in a recession. There's, this, there's a whole economic turmoil that is going on right now with banks. And there's a lot of fear and uncertainty, especially with those of us that don't have what many people consider as job security of a traditional job, although I, I would buck up against that statement. But all that to say, you really, as a business owner, you need to have a plan. And for me to be somebody, I'm the sole provider in my family, there's a lot of weight for me to have a plan of what to do in times of economic uncertainty and to make sure that I have built stability into what we're creating as a family. And you talk about that very thing. So I'm grateful for that because it's an important conversation right now. And I'm also grateful that you have the CPA background so that you're coming in with an, an additional level of knowledge that a lot of people don't have. A lot of people in the finances and wealth space, they speak just from their own personal experience. And you speak from education, personal experience, but also consulting and helping hundreds of people with their own wealth and how to do exactly what you laid out in that framework for us earlier. So connect with Mel. That's all I got to say. Thank you so much for being a part and hanging out. And I look forward to chatting with you next time you're in Nashville. We're going to have to meet up for sure. Without a doubt, without a doubt, this has been so much fun and it's a blessing for me to be able to serve and be part of it. I appreciate you asking me. Of course.